guys, welcome back to a STEM Stream Bio 101 video. We're going to go through in this video pretty quickly the five fundamental characteristics of life that many, many instructors ask their students to get us all to think about the properties that we share with many other living organisms, just like cells, the way that we pass on our hereditary information, the way we metabolize our foods, the transfer of energy, and much, much more. Students ask me to cover this topic in a simple and also a complex way with a little bit of extra material. So I'm gonna cover both, and I think that will give you guys a really good summary and a description of what your teachers want. So first off, we know an organism to be any life form on this planet, whether it's a prokaryote with one cell or a unicellular organism like plants and animals and fungus. We define an organism as anything on this planet that shares the characteristics we're going to cover right now that allow us to define it as living. Now scientists over many, many years came together and basically grouped all of these different properties under these fundamental characteristics to make it pretty simple to define all of life. Personally, I think that's pretty cool because if you think about how many different scientists there are in the world, thinking so many different things, have so many different objective and subjective thoughts, for them to come together as one community, one team, to make a very concise list for everyone and for future students, it's a, they did a pretty good job of doing so and it is very accurate. So the first characteristic of life we're going to talk about is the ability to obtain and use energy. And guys, by the way, none of these are in a very particular order. So you can rearrange these and however you like. Now, for biology terms, we define energy usually in the form of ATP, which is a molecule that is made up of adenosine and phosphate. And this is like the energy currency for cells. This is the way cells transfer energy and it allows the cells to be able to maintain their structure, to stay alive, to maintain gradients, and we're gonna go over much of that in later videos. The second characteristic listed here is structure. Now at the most basic, basic level, a single cell has a structure. Its components inside, called organelles, are bound by a plasma membrane, and this is very important. It's the plasma membrane that keeps the cell bound and kept together. Now, when we think of human structure, we think of skeletons, but at the very basic cellular level, an organism, which at least one cell, has a plasma membrane and a structure. The third characteristic is probably one that you've heard the most about, and that's our DNA. It's our hereditary information. Now, all organisms on this planet have hereditary information, and that's very important to remember, that every single organism must have this information to not only survive but to also reproduce and pass this information to their offspring so that they can live on. Now evolution can change this hereditary information and I put that as number five. When you evolve, an organism evolves mostly by changing its hereditary information that this blueprint can actually be altered and we're going to talk about that much more in detail in later slides. And then the last one, number four, would be reproduction. And that one, like we said, is simply being able to reproduce, have offspring, to be able to pass on your hereditary information, and of course, as a species, survive and thrive in our environment. Now, I want to break down a little further what I mentioned earlier about energy. The fact that all organisms need to be able to consume energy and it's interesting that life is actually broken down by the use of energy and also of how organisms obtain carbon sources and I don't you want I don't want you guys to be scared by flow charts like these and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit but essentially life is made up of producers which are the guys at the bottom of the food chain that provide all of the food for the organisms at the top, which are the consumers. And we're gonna go into the consumers in a little bit, but we, of course, as humans, are gonna be the main consumers at the top of the food chain. So you have the producers at the bottom, the consumers are gonna be at the top. Now, a lot of life uses a very incredible process called photosynthesis that I wanna to mention to you guys. This process is essentially so incredible and fundamental to life on this planet because it allowed the earliest, earliest organisms to be able to survive by producing energy. They were able to produce their own energy by using, as you can see from the graphic, 
they use CO2 from the environment along with water to produce sugars like glucose and cellulose that we know are in plants to, to essentially create their own food. They were literally creating their own food, which is the sugar inside of them by using the environment. Now, if you guys look at the graphic on the left, you're going to see some words that may not be familiar to you, but I just want to explain briefly what they mean. So if you see them again, you'll know what they're referencing to. So on the left, you're going to see the word photo. Now, photo simply means light. So if you see the word photo in front of something, think of light. If you see the word chemo, think of a process called oxidation, which is a chemistry term for extracting energy and electrons, extracting essentially electrons by breaking bonds and removing them from other molecules. Now, almost all of the producers are going to be photoautotrophs. Okay, photo meaning they're going to be using photosynthesis and auto meaning they're going to be producing their own energy. And these guys are going to be your plants, your algae, and some bacteria. Now, the producers are going to obviously produce food for the consumers, which are known as the heterotrophs. Heterotrophs cannot produce their own food. They must rely on producers for food. They consume the food. So if you're wondering, well, would it be better if I was born a plant or a human? That's a good question to ask because if you're born a plant, you don't have to worry about eating another creature, chasing down another animal to eat. You can simply just lay out and tan in the sun get some energy, get some water, get some CO2 from the environment, and use that amazing photosynthetic process to produce your own energy. And that is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Now, I know I went over a lot of information on the last slide covering classification, the way that scientists classify organisms. And I just wanted to give one more quick summary using this image here that basically shows you the breakdown with two parts, an up and a bottom. So the bottom, it consists of prokaryotes. These are your producers at the bottom of the food chain, your unicellular one-celled organisms, okay, that are bacteria and archaea. Then on top, you have your consumers. You have your protista, which are very early, early eukaryotic organisms that evolved from bacteria. And these organisms consist of slime molds, of algae, and also protozoa. And protozoa actually can cause a lot of infections in humans. Of course, there are many species of animals, fungi, and plants as well. So this is a nice little breakdown of the classification system once again for you guys. All right, now we're going to move on to my favorite subject, which are the viruses. Now, we are not the only things that fear viruses. Viruses can infect any cell. So technically, they can infect any organism on this planet because every organism is made up of cells. In humans, they're very commonly causing infections like the cold. That's a very common viral infection we get. But they can also cause more serious infections like the flu. What they do inside of our bodies is that they actually infect our cells. They get inside of our cells and they're able to reproduce and make more viruses once inside of our bodies. They essentially use our own nutrients and energy to make more viruses. And they can, of course, cause more serious conditions like chronic disease, such as hepatitis and also some cancers. Now, if you're wondering why don't scientists classify viruses as living if they can do all of these things and cause so many problems, how are they not living organisms? And the reason is, is because technically they're not membrane bound. Remember, all living things are going to be made up of at least one cell. A cell is membrane bound. Viruses do not contain a membrane. Now, there could be a membrane on the outside of a virus, and that's getting very into its, very much into its structure that we'll cover in another video. But the virus itself is made up of just protein. There is, it is not a membrane bound organism. And another reason why they're not classified as living is because they're not able to produce their own energy. They simply hijack our cells, hijack our own machinery, and the cells, our cells, its host, makes more viruses for it that can burst out of the cell and cause more infection. All right, guys, if you made it this far in the video, I just want to give you a big thumbs up. I know it's a lot of material and I apologize if it's a little bit too much for a beginning biology introductory video, but there is so much important information to discuss and I just want it to be consistent 
with your guys' textbook and what you need to know in class. Now, when it comes to genetic material, the first thing that's gonna pop in your head is probably, okay, we're talking about my DNA. And here is a very detailed image of what DNA actually is. And this is much more of actually a chemistry topic than it is a biology topic. But essentially, DNA is going to be what your cell uses to not only live, to produce proteins, to be able to actually function as a living organism, but it's going to use it to reproduce as well. And finally, the last thing I want you guys to remember about DNA is that when we evolve over many, many years, our DNA is actually evolving. It's the DNA itself that is actually changing ever so slightly to be able to produce an organism that is better fit to survive in its environment, an environment that we know changes over many, many, many years, but it certainly changes and it forces organisms, it forces the DNA to change so it can better survive and move on. And of course, we know that to be something called natural selection, survival of the fittest. All right, guys, that wraps up the video. I hope you were able to get a good foundation on what most of your instructors and textbooks will define as the five fundamental characteristics of life. Now, I just want to do a quick recap. The first being that all organisms on this planet that are considered living must be able to obtain and use energy. The second is that they must have a structure. This is the cell at the very, very fundamental level. The third is that they must possess hereditary information that is some form of DNA. The fourth is that they must be able to reproduce, of course, to create offspring, to continue to live on. And the fifth is that they have to be able to evolve. This takes many, many years, but is an incredible process that allows organisms to adapt to their changing environments so that they can grow, become stronger, and live on for many, many more years. All right, guys, that wraps up the video. See you next time on STEM Stream.